This is at home with Miss Joan. And I know that y'all used to me uh, cutting up and laughing with you and talking about as I'm cooking or telling my silly tales about being a country preacher's wife or different trips that we've took. And today's topic has been on my heart for quite a while, okay? And it's important and uh, it's a serious topic. It's something that we don't want to talk about. We want to put it off. I'd lot like rather be in there in the kitchen cooking than what we're going to talk about. But anyway, we need this conversation. It's on my heart. I know the good Lord wants me to say it. And it's to talk about things that we need to have in order. Should we get sick or should we pass away? And I'm talking about documents, items, things that we need to settle. All of us do in our life, okay? And we always think about, well, it's the elderly that needs to get this done. And I know I'm one of the elderly, okay? And I, But um, young people, if you look at the statistics, younger people die at an alarming high rate. So I want to encourage all my viewers to get your affairs in order, okay? Whatever they are. You may say, well, Miss Joan, I don't really have anything much to get in order. We all do, okay? We all have things that we... Uh, we need to settle. I'm going to read this scripture to you that I looked up this morning. First Timothy 5, 8, the NIV version. It says anyone, well there it is talking to all of us. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. You know, we always interpret that to mean I need to provide for my household. I need to bring in the the bacon, so to speak, every week, the payday, and make sure that everybody's taken care of. But it also could mean that we need to be prepared for our household, how it's going to carry on without us, okay? And that's kind of what we're going to talk about. Preacher and I, we've been in the ministry 50 years. <laughs> and 41, I believe it is, uh, full-time, that he was full-time pastor, and then he's been part-time helping in the churches since he retired. We've seen and been a part of a lot of funerals, counsel with a lot of grieving families. And we've seen a lot of the aftermath that they have to face when the funerals are over and the days ahead. And learned a lot of ways that you could help help your family because we've seen other families go through so much stuff. And, well... The way I see it, we love our daughter so much. We do anything in the world to help her. And so I feel like that is one of the greatest gifts that we can give her is to have our affairs in order. Should we get sick suddenly or should we should we pass away? And, you know, I'm, I'm acting like, what if it happens? But it's when it happens. Because if you've noticed, 100% of the people die. It's always somebody different that dies, okay? We always think it's not going to be us. But we need to face that reality that it could be. But the first thing that I wanted to talk to you about is like, oh, just say that we get we get sick suddenly. There's some things that are, whoever is the closest to us, okay? Whoever is the person that we want to handle stuff, but should we not be able to do it? You see, oh man, I handle stuff. I love to handle stuff. But I realize they could be a time, will be a time when I can't handle stuff. And then I think, well, preacher, preacher will handle it. We work together really good. But he's getting older too. So we've got to know that our daughter knows where a lot of things are, how to handle a lot of things. Should we? Let's just talk about first getting sick, okay? And you be thinking about your loved ones while we're talking about this because, you know, I can get all this done myself without making a video. I was just so hoping that it would prick the hearts of some people that knows that they need to be working on this, but it's just so easy to put it off. And it's, it's something we really need to handle. It'll really help our families if we'll do this. You see, they love us, and when something happens to us, their hearts are going to be broken. They're going to be distraught and have so much uh, stress already on them without having to say, well, mom and daddy never did do this. Mom and daddy never did handle this. That's going to make it even worse on them. And we don't want that. 
You don't want that either. I know you don't. So just say, well, just like now, when you go to the hospitals, what's the first, one of the first questions that they ask you? They say, do you have a, let me see what some of this stuff's cost <laughs> so I can tell it right. They'll say, do you have a advanced directive for health care? And they'll say, or another word, they'll say, do you have a living will or a health care proxy? Well, that's just a document that you would fill out that um, tells the, your end of life wishes, you know, like, do I want to be put on life support? Do I want a feeding tube if I'm unconscious? Uh, you know, what do I want to happen to me? It's really a good thing. It carries out your wishes instead of everybody standing around you thinking, wonder what she wanted. We get scared about those kind of documents when we get asked that, but it's really uh, for our good that we fill those things out. When they say, you got to live in will, well, <laughs> so many people that don't realize what it is, they'll think, well, my goodness, they're wanting to know about my last will and testament. No, that's two different things we're talking about. This is the last, let's just call the living will, that's the last wishes for your body. The last will and testament is the last wishes for your possessions that you own. That would be the difference, you see. So the hospitals and the doctors, they're asking about, um, you know, what is your wishes for your living will? You make it while you're living. So you tell them while you're living what your wishes are. Two or three pages and you just have to read it and mark yes or no and then go back and initial it. And you just get a couple of witnesses. And then you also appoint what's called a health care proxy. And, and what that means is you will pick out someone or two people usually, one person that you would say, this is the person that I want to carry out my wishes for me. That'll be somebody there that's healthy and living and you're sick and they're handling that, making sure your last wishes are made known. You pick your first choice. And then you pick your second choice in case the first choice is not able to serve at that time. That won't take long. A lot of times the um, hospital has these documents if you want to fill it out there and uh, get it witnessed. Or if you want to uh, get a copy from your doctor's office or whatever, go home and look at it real slow and take your time. But the important thing is that we do complete what's called the Advanced Directive for Healthcare known as the living will or the health care proxy. And lots of people call those, that person that you picked out to handle that, they call that your health care power of attorney. Okay, that's another word for it. Doesn't mean the power of attorney to sell your property or handle your financial affairs. It just means for your health care. Okay, so it's good to talk over uh, what you want with your relatives and then to, all that is is putting it into writing there it is you keep a copy of it give it to the hospital or whatever and they'll have it you know this person who's close to you they need to know your medications so many times they don't know it's an emergency situation and they don't know what you're allergic to or they don't know what medications you're on the hospital needs to know that or or your whoever wherever you're at if you're really sick and then to take it a, a level deeper, if you're sick for any length of the time, your bills has got to be paid, okay? <laughs> and does this person know where you keep your bills? Do they know what they are? We have a list of our bills. The preacher and I sit down every month on the first day of the month, and we pay our bills, and we don't have to think about it anymore. But you know, our daughter needs to know where that's at in case she has to handle it. We go a lot of places together, so we could both have a tragedy together, you know, or both be sick at the same time. And so she knows where that's at. In other words, make your person know where you keep your stuff. You may have some bills that comes out automatically. You may have some you pay yourself and or write the check and mail it in, uh, the things that are drafted out. The person that's close to you needs to know that. And another thing is they'll have to know your income because if this person's going to be paying your bills for a while, they're going to know. You get a Social Security check on the 15th and a retirement on the 1st or, you know, you got to have income if you're going to pay those bills. So the main purpose of this is your trusted person, whether it's your children, your spouse, or 
a dear friend. They need to know this so they can help you in case of emergency. Do they know how to get into your house? Do, you, do they know where you hide the key? Or have you given them an extra key so that they can get in? Just things like that we need to think about, okay? I'm hoping that I'll jug your memory or your ideas. And listen, if there's something that I don't talk about that I'm trying to get in order myself, will you post it down into the comments? Because, see, I'm bound to leave some very important stuff out. But we'll help one another through this. How about that? Because uh, Miss Joan wants to have things in order so that Jordan doesn't have all the problems. Uh, Preacher does, too that uh, she could face had we just not done anything. I know it's hard sometimes if you cannot, like, say, well, I can't trust my children, Miss John, like, like you trust your daughter. At this particular time, what they're going through, I just can't turn all, let them know that information. Well, think of a trusted friend that could do that for you, okay? There's someone in your life that you could trust to talk it over and they may need to talk their things over with you and you could say well we'll just share this together you know there is someone to help you just make sure that someone knows uh, something about you so they can help you in your time of need also here in when we're thinking about should we be incapacitated and not be able to handle our affairs there's a document called a durable power of attorney you know we talked about a health care power of attorney earlier. Well, this is talking it is talking about your your financial affairs, any type of business that you normally handle, your power of attorney could do that for you. This is a document that uh, I would advise you just taking the time to get it done with an attorney, or I, I know there are some online that you can print out, but they do have to be witnessed. Go by the laws in your state, because see, I don't know who I was watching this, but... Uh, here in Alabama, it has to be a notary has to sign it. So you need to look up the laws in your state. But you get a, a power of attorney, and that means that you're turning, they can do anything that you can do legally. Your bank accounts, your uh, real estate, whatever. So that's really super, super got to be somebody that you trust. But you also... Um, I read somewhere you can get a, a power of attorney and they just handle one thing for you. So you say, well, I'm just going to get a power of attorney where they just uh, can handle my checking account, you know, while I'm sick or whatever. So you can look into all those documents, see, with a, somebody far smarter than me because I'm not trying to get out, give out legal advice. I'm not uh, qualified. But I do know that we have done the durable powers of attorney for, you know, me to preacher and preacher back to me and that sort of thing. So. If so, should anything happen that he could handle my stuff, I could handle his. So just be thinking about that, getting you a power of attorney, if that's something that you think that you need while you're sick. Now, you know, your your checking account may just be in your name where you pay all your bills. Well, they're not, whoever's helping you, they're not going to be able to do that, see, unless they're on your account or they have your power of attorney. Now I'm going to... Like I said, you comment down below things that if you get sick or, or I do, things that we need to think about, okay? Also, pets too. Or you have pets that's just like your children, you know. Somebody that's going to take care of your stuff that can take care of your uh, pets or whatever. One of my friends, man, I, I mean, she has her pet that's so, so dear to her. And she always makes sure that that uh, baby's took care of. So, uh, I'm going to move now into a... A more serious part of it is not only have we been sick, but should we pass away, okay? And it's hard. It's, I know it's hard for us to think about us passing away. We think we're just going to live on forever. We are somewhere. But when I was asking preacher, okay, what is some things that we need to tell the people here if we're talking about dying? And, of course, sick too. He said, well, John, make sure that they've made peace with the good Lord. You know, that they've made peace with the Lord and they know what's going to happen to them no matter what happens in their life. So that would be our most important thing that we would say. And then we feel like that to leave stuff in order for your family, they'll have that peace. They know where you're at. And then they'll also need to carry out your wishes. And so if you will make a will, so many people put that off. And there's been this saying, you know, like, 
Well, either you make a will or the state makes it for you. And what they're saying is if you haven't already taken the time to make your uh, last will and testament, then the state's got one because they will be deciding how your possessions are dispersed, how anything, your money or whatever's dispersed. If you had a don't have a will and you had all these accounts with just your name on it. So I've made that very clear. It is so important. And you can uh, sit down and write out your hand, your own handwriting a will and you can find them online and you can get them witnessed. But I'm telling you what's the truth now. We went to see a lawyer, okay, because that is, you don't want no misinterpretation on your last will and testament, okay? You go see a lawyer. They're not going to charge you that much money, and then you're going to have this peace of mind that it's worded right. It's worded how you want it worded, and your things will be dispersed how you want them dispersed should something happen to you. So my advice is to go see a lawyer and not just take any kind of, a copy that you see somewhere and you're going to copy it and do it yourself. But that's what we did. And even years ago when our daughter was young, our first will that we made, then we appointed a guardian for her. You see, you don't want your children to be left for the state to decide who, who gets them or you know what I mean? You want to have it in your life's will and testament. I have minor children and I would like for so-and-so to be their guardian. And we did that. Then when she was grown, we went back and updated our will. So you can change it at any time. You can change it. And we took that part out because she's grown and she could handle handle things for herself. But you got small children, you'd be sure you get a will and you have uh, it noted in there who you want to be the guardians of your children. They say, I read somewhere that 30% of people over 65 do not have a will. I couldn't believe that because, you know, it's just that so important. You will name in the will what's called an executor or an administrator. I think those words are interchangeable. But it is someone, just like you named it in your um, health care proxy, uh, advanced directive, who you wanted to make sure your wishes was carried out. Well, in your will with, about your financial situation, property, whatever you've got, then you appoint this executor or administrator, and then they are the one that sees that your wishes are carried out. See, they, they can do that legally. So you want to make sure, take the time, I mean, take the time and go make your will. And you say, well, again, I can't put one of my children down as executor or administrator. You don't have to. You put down somebody you trust to carry it out, okay? That's what you need is somebody that you fully trust to do that. But you will be having to name someone, and, and usually you name two. You name one that you want to carry it out, but you name a backup, a, a number two person, just in case that number one person can't serve or chooses not to serve at that time because you don't never know what other people's going through. Right at the top of mine, preacher's list, is to get your will made. All of these documents that we're talking about, put them where your um, next of kin or your person that you trust knows where they're at. So many times we've dealt with families and this, I know mama had a will, but I don't know where the world is at, okay? And I will tell this one quick story. Well, Ricky's had two sisters to pass away and uh, his uh, younger sister I forgot they said, oh, she's got an advanced directive. She's got an advanced directive. Well, she never had told us, you know, one of those uh, living wills, health cares, tells what her life, end of life wishes, and she was dying, okay, or really sick. And we went to her apartment, and we tore that apartment up trying to find it, okay? And we did find it in the weirdest place ever. Well, I'll just tell you where it was at, in the door of the refrigerator. Okay, I don't know what the precious thing was thinking, but anyway, it was in the door of the refrigerator. I don't know if she thought with a house fire or whatever, be safe. But anyway, we found it, and thank the good Lord, we got to go by it with her end-of-life wishes. So I just want you to know it does happen, okay? So put things in a safe place and let somebody know where it's at. It will save your family a whole lot of stress and trauma should something happen to you. We're going to talk about your funeral plans. I've got mine in a folder here, and we're trying to make, we we have folders on all of our stuff, but I have my funeral plans written out here, and Preacher has his, because uh, our daughter is going to be, like I said 
grieving and just so much to handle, at least she may think, well, wonder what daddy would have wanted, wonder what mama would have wanted. Well, write it out, okay? Used to, years ago, they'd write it out and put it in the big family Bible. Y'all remember that? But write out your wishes, who you want for the ministers to speak or friends to speak or um, songs. You know, so many times we'll think, well, I can't remember what their favorite song was. Well, write that down. If it's something that you want, if you don't care what they do at your service, okay, just make a little note. Whatever brings you the most comfort for the service, you pick it out and do it, you know. That's that's leaving your wishes, okay? The main thing is we've got to spend some time writing down, put it in a good place where our kids or our friend knows where it's at, our life's wishes. I remember, I'll tell this quick story. After mother's funeral, this lady said, well, I, your mama always wanted me to sing so-and-so at her funeral. Well, mother never had told me, so I didn't know. I went by what mama did tell me, What a Friend in Jesus was her favorite song. She only played as everybody walked out. And, you know, we went by what mama had told us and what mama had wrote down, but it wasn't on there. So write it down if it's important or if, if they've told you something like that, then tell the family. Don't wait and tell them when the service is over, <laughs> like what happened to me. Oh, write down for your burial. If you're having a burial plot, we've got to convey this to our loved ones. You know, we think we're going to be around to handle it. <laughs> we're not going to be. And uh, you may say, well, you know, I decided to be cremated. But you never told your family, so they go spend a whole lot more money for a traditional funeral when really what your wishes was was something completely different. So convey that to your family. Write it down and put it in all these files that you're keeping together where your loved one knows to go find it, okay? And uh, if you have got to buy a burial plot, put those papers in there. Write down the cemetery. You just assume that your loved ones know all this, but make sure about writing it down. I will say, not too long ago, I had a relative that passed away and the, the one, the next of kin was handling it all, paid for the funeral plot, and I got a hold of him and I said, well, you do know he bought that way back years ago when his wife died. And he said, no, they charged me for it. I said, well, such and such, such a time, well, he already paid that, I was with him. Well, that he got a refund because see, they was going to have to pay for the funeral plot twice. So put all these documents down. And that's real common for when the first spouse dies, the, the spouse will go ahead and buy their plot. But if you don't document it somehow or another, and you live many years after that, your family don't know it, so they buy it again. It's just a lot of little things that uh, if you'll take the time and sit down, it's going to be one of the greatest love gifts that you ever gave your family because they've loved you all these years. And now they're going to love you so much because mama or daddy took the time to write out their wishes. I didn't have to dwell on it and think on it. I'm carrying out my parents' wishes. Also, you may think this is silly, but write out your obituary. I was talking to one of my friends who's been really, really sick. and We was talking about what she would like her funeral to be. And I said, well, you're going to have to write out your obituary. I said, because I don't know all the different, I don't know what all you would want to say about your career because she's had such a, a wonderful, various career, you know. And uh, I said, write those things out and put it in your paperwork if you want, you know, that to be carried out. Because you don't think about that a lot of times, uh, writing down your obituary, who your relatives are and how you want it listed in the paper or everywhere it's printed at. Do that. Now, I'm giving you a lot of homework. I'm giving me a lot of homework, too, because there's things that I've been getting prepared for months and months and things ready. Uh, maybe a long time, maybe a short time. We don't know. But we'll leave that what I call love gift behind for our family. Some people go ahead and they do what that's called a prepaid funeral, too. We'll go ahead and go over there and pick it out, pay for it and everything. Uh, you can do that, but make sure that all that paperwork is also in this file for your family to have it. You're going to need it because nowadays, well, I hate to say it, but funeral homes, they'll sell from one company to the next to the next. Okay, you need those original copies just in case they don't have theirs when something happens, okay? Um, uh, beneficiaries. Have you checked the beneficiaries on your insurance policies 
Are they up to date? Are the people who are the beneficiaries really the people that you want to be the beneficiaries? You say, well, Miss John, what in the world are you talking about? It would be good in this files, these files that we're building if we'll put the names of the policies that we have and who the beneficiaries are. And I will say, this is many, many years ago, but I do know this happened where this lady had several kids and her husband died suddenly. And he never had changed his work insurance out of his mama's name. He had his mama's name on it when he was a single man. And, you know, that's just one of them things he let slip through the cracks. So the insurance company paid the money to his mama. Well, you would think his mama would let her have it. She's got all them kids to raise that was his. But she didn't. She kept it. So that does happen, okay? So update your beneficiaries. Think about it. Oh, I've been, you know, I divorced, but I never have took my ex-wife off of my insurance. Stuff like that. Just make sure that what you do have, proper paperwork's filled out so the people that you want to get it is going to receive the funds, okay? And just um, your bank accounts, if you have... Um, more than one or one, put the bank account down on the list and write the number. Different accounts that you got, CDs, certificates of deposits, whatever you got, write the account numbers down. So your family say their hearts is breaking, they're sad, but they've got to look this stuff up. They've got to pay the expenses of the funeral. I did want to say something while ago in the will. You was just pointing the executor or the administrator. You can write a letter of in, uh, intent to the executor saying, you know, this is how I want my funeral to go. This is how I want it to be. And that might be what you need to do. Uh, there is write a kind of a letter to your executor who's going to be carrying out all this if it's not one of your family members. I wish that y'all could answer me right now and say, well, Miss Joan, you left out this. Miss Joan, you left out that. So write it down in the comment because other people will watch this and they'll read the comments and they'll they'll get your comment and it will really help them, okay? And uh, I thought long and hard about this, but I know that I've probably left out something. Nowadays, there's digital accounts. You know, we're getting more into the world of the digital. And those digital accounts has passwords and account numbers. What? i got a password book that I write all my passwords in, and the preacher knows where it's at. It's his password book, too. And my daughter knows where it's at, and we refer to that book often. In fact, we <laughs> refer to it as, instead of go get the password book when we need it, I'll, they'll say, I'll say, go get the book Mama loves so, but they just laugh about it because this old joke, the preacher had come to visit this family and they all sitting around d eating dinner, you know, and uh, they told the kid that was sitting there, said, uh, run, get the book Mama loves so. Well, they all thought that the kid was going to run and get the Bible, you know, and that was going to impress the preacher. The kid run and got the Sears and Roebuck catalog <laughs> And brought it back to the table. And that's always been the joke. Go get the book, Mama Loves So. That's why we call my password book, Go Get the Book, Mama Loves So. Because I am constantly writing passwords in it. Because there's so many on everything. I'd like for them to cut back on them, but they're not going to. So we got to keep up with them. With our uh, list of stuff that we're keeping and putting. Keeping in a good place for our family. If you got a safety deposit box. A lot of people keep their will. Their deeds, that's another thing you need to be putting in the place with all your uh, stuff we're putting up for the end of our life. Some of them keep a lot of stuff in their safety deposit box at the bank. Well, who's got the extra key? Is the person authorized to go in your box that's going to have to handle all this stuff for you? See, there's things to think about. Like again, just someone you trust. Put them on it that you know will handle it like you want it. Now this, you're going to think, why did you include this, Miss Joan, in your story or your help for us? Here it goes. Would you purge your stuff? <laughs> well, Y'all all know I'm in my late 60s, and I over the years, you can accumulate a lot of stuff. Your kids nowadays... Most of them don't want even want our stuff, do they? Our junk. My daughter teases me. She says, Mama, I'm going to call 1-800-JUNK. They're going to pull up out front and just, just to haul it off. And I say, I'll haunt you. <laughs> but anyway, uh, what it is is, you know, 
we can, now that we're retired or we got some more time, we could be purging some of this stuff, couldn't we? I always ask her before I get rid of something. I said, do you want this? Most of the time she says no. Okay, I'm trying to make what we've been talking about so serious a little bit more lighthearted. But it is important that we clean out our stuff. You could die suddenly. You could die tragically really, really fast. Do you want your kids to have to walk in and handle everything that you could have already been working on? Think about it. Uh, when we retired uh, seven years ago, I believe, we started purging. I mean, we trailer loads we've got rid of, yard sailed and donated and Facebook marketplace. We've done everything. Now, preacher says, now we're out of the yard sale business. It, it's a lot of work in them things, but whatever you choose to do, go through your stuff and disperse of it or go ahead and give it to family members that want it. Hey, some people be tickled to death to get some of your stuff. But go ahead and do that. Should you uh, something happen to you suddenly or, or not suddenly, then that will save a lot of heartache on your children having to go through all of that. So go ahead and try to be purging your stuff down. And I've still got more that I need to purge. And I'm sure my camera lady would say, what, amen? <laughs> amen. I'm going to end with this, okay? Okay, we're going to get down to the last thing that I'm going to talk to you about. And, you know, we've talked about a lot of serious documents that we need to get in order and get them filed and keep them in a place where our family members knows where they're at. It takes something called a legacy love letter that you might want to leave your children. I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to read you part of mine. When we opened up Mama's will, I knew she had the will and all that. But, you know, it's made years ago. But when we opened it up, out fell what we call a legacy love letter. She had wrote all three of us a letter, three kids. <laughs> I'm going to read the part that's to me. Since I hadn't asked my two brothers if I could read their part. But you can sit down sometime and you just write out your final love letter to your family, okay? It says, uh, my dearest children... Why I keep thinking I should write and tell you how much each one of you mean to me, I don't know. But sometimes things happen in life, and I may not have a chance to tell you in words. So, whew. so it's a little hard. So here is my way of telling you what each one of you mean to me. She starts out with me because I'm the oldest. Joan, you're the first child. So I'll start by trying to tell you how much I waited for you to arrive. You'll never know until you have a child of your own. I didn't have uh, Jordan at this time. What love you brought into our home. Thanks for being a daughter that never broke my heart. I love you so much. There surely must have been something good in your daddy and me or God would have never sent you to us. It's in her handwriting, and boy, that really is, it shakes you up to see it. I loved her. So when it comes time for me to die, don't grieve over me, for I have lived a happy life, had three wonderful children, and a husband I love very much. You see, Joan, who could ask for anything more? Always be happy. Smile through your troubles. Trust in God. And when you become old, you can look back. It's, it's special to me reading it today because I am older now. And when you become old, you can look back over your life and be so proud of it. There has never been troubles larger than God, I know. Because he has brought me through many a, a heartache. I love you, mother. And she goes on and she talks to my, my two brothers. And then she brings it all together here. She said, uh, when your dad died, I felt like my life was over too. But you children changed that when you needed me. You loved me, and you worried over me. Thanks for loving me. Never stop loving one another. 
your friends and your neighbors. Because you see, love is what God is. She, that was her dying wish that me and my two brothers get along. And we have worked hard at that. Well, that may be somebody watching this. That's what you need to do when you know it. You need to get along. Make peace. You, you can still do it. And you can forget all the heartaches of the past. Anyway, it's what she told us. <sighs> Did I don't know if I said this. Thanks for loving me and never stop loving one another. Your friends and your neighbors. Because you see, love is what God is. Now, to all three of you, don't never be too proud to call on God because he can help in every need. When you see the sunshine, look at pretty flowers. Oh, she loved flowers. Or see a baby smile. Remember that God makes all that. So he will surely help you. Now you're going to be lonely after I'm gone. But just think of our happy times we had together and that I've gone on a wonderful journey to visit all my loved ones and meet God in heaven. Until we meet again, love to all three. And she signed it, Mother. Pull something like that out of one of them documents. I'm telling you what, that's my legacy love letter right there. I wouldn't take a million dollars for this this letter. Who wrote it now? Many years before she passed. But she tucked it away. None of us had ever read it until she had gone. Handle your affairs with you, will you? God has been so good to me, and I'm thankful that I'm ready to go should you call my name. Uh, I hope I leave a legacy of love to a lot of people. But I just wanted to get on here and make this video and because I just my heart says encourage others to get their things in order. It's one of the greatest things that we can do to help our children or our loved ones or whoever we got left behind to help them, to take some of the heartache and the burden off of them is for us to do this right now. Will you start acting on yours? Will you finish working on yours? Maybe you started, you laid it aside a while back. Finish it out. Let your kids know where everything is. You got good kids and you trust them, then put them on the, all of this and help them. It'll relieve their burden because they're going to be crying. They're going to be heartbroken. I know you're thinking, well, Miss John, you've hit me with this video and I'm so busy right now. Uh, we're looking at the holidays that are coming up and, and all of this. But this is all important stuff that we need to get done. We need to take it as serious as we do. Like, oh, I'm going to get my daughter. I'm going to try to surprise her really good and have her a nice Christmas present this year or whatever. Look at this as one of the best gifts that you could give your children. It's to have your stuff in order and in a certain place where they can find it should something happen or when something happens. It'll, I think it'll give us all a peace of mind too to carry on and enjoy the rest of our days knowing, hey, we've handled that. I don't, you know, you do need to update things along the way, but you've handled a big part of it should something happen to you. Suddenly, your children will be ready your, in your next of kin. I know this was a stout subject to talk to today, but I just felt like we needed to go over it. And please comment below uh, things that you thought of that I might need to do or that I forgot to say on the video because uh, it might help somebody. You don't never know. Anyway, all of this today from At Home with Miss Jones.